in Luke 11, he was talking to the Pharisees, and this is in red print, okay? He said to them... In the red print. In the red print, you guys, the words of Jesus. That's right. He said to them, it's good that you tithe, Pharisees. It's probably the the only nice thing he said to them in the entire New Testament. He's like, it's good that you tithe, but you're forgetting to love God. You're forgetting about the things that are important because they had herbs and they were tithing like 10% of the income of their herbs. And Jesus was like, hey, like it's good that you're tithing and you should, but you're forgetting to love God because the two commandments that fulfill all of them are love God and love your neighbor. Yeah. And you love God by tithing because it says that it's holy and it's set apart, just like we are holy and set apart. So what does that mean? We belong to God. So if the tithe is holy... It was never ours. It belongs to him. Exactly. It's kadosh in Hebrew, holy. I'm Chris Valentin. Welcome to Cultural Catalyst, where we teach you how to co-labor with God, live fully alive, and change the world. And I'm with Samia Petalino. Did I get it right? Perfect. Woo-hoo. And you wrote this wonderful book, Money Handbook. The Money Handbook, Spiritual Keys and Practical Steps to Finance. Yes. And I wrote a book on finance. We both wrote a book we on did. finance. So today we're going to talk a little bit about money. Tell us, first of all, a little bit about you. I grew up in a traditional Jewish home. So you're Jewish. I am. All Jewish people are wealthy? Pretty much. That's the stereotype. It's true. Yes. Is it true? It is. Wow. Okay. Mostly true. Mostly yes. true. And um, <clears throat> I mean, full blown, my entire family's Jewish. I was bought mitzvahed. I learned to read and write Hebrew. I've been to Israel many times. And um, I grew up in a home where just money was talked about. It was very normal. It was part of a culture it was almost like a language um that they would speak on all the time all the time so, investments so and jewish all people are they they don't have any they don't have any concerns about money there's about, no shame around there's no it. shame that's where i was like yeah it, it's more about leaving a legacy and imparting to the generation below you which would be myself or you know my kids um how to multiply wealth so when God said to Abraham, "I'm going to give you the power to make wealth, that I might that I, that I might validate my covenant with you," yes, that sort of got ingrained, honestly, in the Jewish people. Yes. I, I kind of tease, but it really is ingrained in the Jewish yes. people. Like when you meet a Jewish person who who isn't fairly well off, honestly, I know it's a stereotype, but it kind of surprises you, right? Because it's kind of in the DNA mm-hmm. of Jewish people. You have a couple of children. You're married. Talk about I that do. for a minute. Um, I have a wonderful husband. Come His on. name's Nicholas. Show him the rock. You got to show him this. Come on. Chris That's the rock right the there. Rock. He did good. The husband did good. He did good. We have two children. They're young. I have a three-year-old and an almost five-year-old. So we have a house of toddlers, and it is a season of tired. But When's we're doing it. When's the last time you slept all night? It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. Wow. I know, but we're doing it. That's amazing. And so... You, what inspired you to write this book? And tell us a little bit about the book. Um, I have about 20 years of experience in finance. Okay. So I got into banking and finance when I was like straight out of college. And I ended up becoming a financial advisor for many years. And I was on a team and we managed over $200 million. So I learned a wow. lot how to manage money. Wow. And after I did that, I ended up uh, with a friend of mine. We opened up a high-end clothing store. So I kind of, I transitioned from finance to fashion but i also like basically got the school of hard knocks on how to be a small business owner because corporate america is so different than owning your own business so i was able to gain an experience in both and of course i was in charge of the money for the store but um, when you were a financial advisor Yes. So you were actually working in corporate America. Yeah, because I was working for a banking institution. Big business. Managing high net worth people's money. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you become an entrepreneur in this fashion business. Mm -hmm. Was it a fashion store? Were you making your own clothes? Tell tell me, I am personally interested, like, 
What yeah. were you doing? Uh, it was a clothing store, and we would bring in brands. So we actually would go to Italy and import clothes in Amsterdam. Oh, and we'd it. take buying trips to New York, and we would just fill the store with beautiful things and sell them to women. So I essentially was dealing with the same type of clientele, but instead of managing their money, I was helping them spend it. And Way how did you fun. do? Was really well. It, was it easy? You need a Jesus when yeah. you own a business. Yeah. <laughs> totally. It's I, real. I was wondering, yeah. Um, it's uh, really a great place to learn humility and to have character ingrained in your soul in the yeah. deepest, innermost parts. Did you have like employees? Oh, yeah. How many employees did you have? Um, we had under 10, mm -hmm. but uh, the store did almost seven figures. So we, I carried a lot of responsibility. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's, that's really good. Yeah. How long did you do that for? Six years. And then I sold it. Oh, it's still going right it's now. It's still there. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. What inspired you like to go into fashion? It was just, you were just interested in it. I always have loved fashion and it just, <laughs> the opportunity presented itself and um, so I just jumped into it. It was What it was city were you doing that in? It was in the Palm Beach area in South Florida, which is where I'm from, where I grew up. Yeah. So there's a lot of wealth there. There is. What What are the main things that you learned? Like, okay, so you have a degree in business or... Yep, I do. Right? And then you worked in the, in the corporate world I did. with big business. You're mm -hmm. advising people how to use their money. Right. How to spend their money, how to save their money, how to make money from their money. Yep. And then you go into a small business. With, you have a partner? I did. Okay, so what did you, was there any, like, aha moment when you went from telling other people, teaching other people how to spend their money to you haven't been responsible to make payrolls, mm -hmm. pay rents and all that? So one of the main things I overcame was fear. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Because fear will limit you. Yeah, tell us about with that. With what God has for your life. And I really began to step into my like full identity of who I am as a daughter of the King. And um, I teach at the Bethel School of Ministry. Yes, and you do. one of the things I tell the students is to imagine themselves that their dad is the King of England. And you're like born into this royal family. Prince Charles is your younger brother, your sister in law is Kate. Would you think different about your resources and what you have access to? Did you, when, you, when you went into business, were you immediately successful? Yes. Yeah, see, opposite of mine. Like, you probably know my story, right? Yes. So, so I, you know, I didn't grow up with wealth. I didn't grow up with a wealth mentality. I have no education beyond high school. So, I, you know, our first uh, business was an auto repair shop and service station. Mm -hmm. And I had the opposite. You know, I went in and I'm like, wow, I have these prophecies, five prophecies in a week that I'm going to, you know, God's going to bless me if I open a business. And I spent nine years not making money. I mean, you know, enough yeah. to pay for my, yeah, mostly pay for my family, but, or, you know, to, to, to uh, take care of my family, but that was it. So I was very surprised at how hard it was. Yeah. Much it's different. still hard, even if you have success. Yeah. I mean, when I say I was successful right away, the first year we broke even. To me, that's successful. I oh, didn't yeah, lose yeah. any money. Of course. <laughs> in the first year, that's amazing. And then after that, we started to become profitable. So as a small business owner, that is success. You don't lose any money the first year. Well done. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the principles like you'd like to share? We've got people watching us from all walks of life. Yeah. And, you know, some, some very wealthy people will be following us and some people that are just starting their families. And, you know, I was just at Dave Ramsey's last month and, you know, he's teaching all these principles of wealth. He's done a fantastic job of just training so many in the body of Christ. What, what principles have you learned or things that you've experienced that you would say, okay, this is a breakthrough. The first one is fear. You got to get past fear. Totally. And how does fear affect the way you live financially? Well, fear lies to you about who the character of God is. Okay. Um, you know, we're called to be partakers of the divine nature. Yeah. And his nature is not poverty. Mm, why don't you talk about that? Because the church has a, um, a love affair with poverty in my mind. That's a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they do. And, yeah. you know, you, you know we're, my, when I, my book came out, well, let me say this, way before my book came out, you know, Bill and I have been tagged the prosperity teachers. Okay. And I, I don't know how they got that. I don't have a jet or anything, you know. Bill's got one on his, you know, his a picture of one on a wall. But 
So the prosperity gospel is, you know, supposedly negative. Right. And yet you're telling me that the kingdom isn't is prosperous. It is. The prosper the kingdom is prosperous. Right. So tell me about that. So so if I'm poor, do I not have a relationship with God? No, you, you can still have a relationship with God, with, but it doesn't make you more spiritual if it, you're poor. It, there you go. So one of the things that we're called to is we are a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. Okay. Uh, Second Peter talks yes. about that. So, I mean, what is the priesthood, right? So if you look at the book of Leviticus, which I'm sure all of you good Bible reading I, devotional I read people read this morning. The priesthood, the, they do four main things. They put God on, God on display, yeah. right? I mean, they're in the desert yeah. and they're wearing like blue linen <clears throat> turbans. Like they stick out. You can fashion. be like, oh, that's a priest. That's where you got the fashion from yes. right there. Uh, the second thing they do is they bring people to atonement. So in the Old Testament, they would do sacrifices. But for us, we show people the salvation, like yes. who Jesus is. Yeah, beautiful. The third thing they did is they would intercede. They would pray. We're called to all these things. Put God on display, show people who Jesus is, evangelism, right? Pray for them. And the fourth things they did, which I find amazing, is they distributed resources. Okay, tell me about that part. It's so, been a, a couple of days since I read Leviticus. It's one of my favorite books, though. So that is the priesthood. <laughs> Second Peter's talking about it. And even the Lord said in Exodus, you will be to me a kingdom of priests. Yes. Plural. So if we're called <clears throat> to be priests and we're called to be living this out, then we are called to be people who distribute resources. And if you are living in poverty, it is very hard to do that. In the same way that we can walk in the blessings of Abraham, yeah. Galatians chapter 3, yeah. that we have access to the promises of Abraham through our faith in Jesus. Yeah. Well, what are the promises of Abraham? Well, you go back to Genesis 12, and it's when the Lord said to him, all nations will be blessed through you. Yeah. So nations represent people. It doesn't necessarily mean you're traveling from continent to continent. Here at the Bethel School of Ministry, 40% of the students are international. I yeah. mean, in my classroom. Yeah, you got the world. The nations are right there. And so for us to walk that out, it's very important that we learn how to create wealth and we get out of the mindset that... Uh, poverty equals spiritual, like being spiritual. Yeah, and it's it's funny to me because there is a there is a poverty mentality in the church. There really is, and I don't mean every single person has right. it. Of course, it's a blanket statement. Yeah. it's never going to be accurate about every single person. Uh, but there is a sense that if you get wealthy, you're like the rich young ruler who right. can't actually come into the kingdom. And yet Jesus spoke; he taught more about money than he, he taught did. about heaven or hell. Which is interesting. Yeah, and regarding the rich young ruler, it's yeah. interesting to me because he said to him, go and sell all that you own yeah. and give it to the poor. He yeah. didn't say give it to my ministry. There Why? Because if you give it to the poor, they can't repay you. And there's a very strong mm. biblical principle that you give to when that person can't repay you because the Lord says if you give to the poor, mm -hmm. I will repay. And some translations say with dividends. Yeah. So it's very important uh, when we give that there's no like ulterior motive of wanting something back in return because giving and tithing is a key that opens a very large door. Yeah, Jesus said, give and it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, running out all over, it shall be, men shall pour into your lap. Yes. Which is interesting because if you give and then the Lord gives back to you, in other words, I kind of see it in this uh, spectrum of time. So if I meet somebody over here that gives everything away, so he's a rich young ruler, let's yeah. say metaphorically, and he's broke, I'm like, and he's he's following the Lord, he's spiritual, he's following the Lord, he's broke, and I meet him at this at this time in his timeline, he's broke, and I go, oh, spiritual and broke, right? That's great, but then if you give, he's going to give back to you, press down. So I find him in the continuum four years later, and he's prosperous. Mm -hmm. At what point? In other words. There's so, so many people can only see him here, as you were pointing out. Like, he's broke and he's spiritual. Mm -hmm. But as he prospers from his giving, suddenly I see him as not, there's something wrong with that. In, I'm talking about in the mentality of the church. The prosperity gospel, the, the, the young ruler got wealthy again through his generosity, mm -hmm. through his obedience, through his faithfulness to God. Yeah. 
What I would say is it's really important for people to know their identity as a son Mm -hmm. or a daughter because everything comes from that place. So if you know that you're a son and you're called to be set apart, in Deuteronomy 28, which is like the chapter of blessings, Mm -hmm. the Lord said, I will command my blessing on you so that all the peoples of the earth will know you're mine. What does that, what does that look like? That looks like you're putting God on display. Yeah. So he commands his blessing on his people, but they're not all receiving it. So it's like many are called, but few are chosen. Why? It's the heart response. It's the soil. It's the parable of the soil. Well, there's four different soils, but only one, the seed could take root. Yeah. Because the other uh, seeds got snatched by the enemy or the lure of wealth or whatever the reason was, it couldn't. But the fourth soil, it had 30, 60, and 100 fold. Jesus is talking about believers. Why didn't everyone get 100 fold? Yeah. It's how much we're able to be trusted with. And I just really believe that if God can trust you with money, he can trust you with anything. Oh, that's so really Because it's the litmus of the heart. It's the litmus test of the heart. So it's our soil. People are watching. They're 40 years old. They've lived in poverty, in lack, their entire life. They love God. Yep. They're faithful. How would you advise them? Like you're, you're a financial advisor by, by training mm-hmm. and by gift. Where do they start? So what I would tell somebody like that is... Um, They have to change their mindsets. Okay. And they have to start dreaming with Jesus. Because if the dream they have isn't going to take finances that they don't think that they can attain, the dream isn't big enough. Okay, say it again. If the dream they have, basically what I mean is if it's like they can accomplish it themselves, they need to think bigger. Got it. Because you have to invite Jesus Mm. into your finances. Yes. And a lot of people don't. They believe him for healing and they believe him for other things. But for whatever reason, it's like they're not inviting him in. And it's so important that they do that. How do I invite God into my finance? I'm like, all right, Lord, I invite you into my finance. Is God in my finance? Like, you, is there is there yeah. other steps? Is so my the point. practical yeah, it starts way. starts with an attitude, of course. But. Yeah. The practical way to invite the Lord into your finance is one. Um, having a life of, like a lifestyle of giving, it's really important. Okay, so generosity number generosity one. Generosity is huge. Okay, you mentioned tithing. Generosity. That's like tithing. a cuss word among I Christians. No. Like the church just trying to get my money. Yeah, I know. What do you think about that? What I would say to that is, <clears throat> you know, tithing originated. The church today gets their tithe. Their, you know, give us ten percent. It's from the Levitical law that was mm-hmm. given to Moses. Yeah, and. Before that, Abraham was on the scene when his nephew Lot was taken captive by the four kings and he sent all his troops out to get Lot and he did and he won. Yeah. Melchizedek shows up and his name means king of righteousness and king of peace. So he's kind of like a Jesus-like figure. Yeah. And Hebrew says that he's a priest forever, just like Jesus is a priest yeah. forever. And Abraham, out of the goodness of his heart, because he was just so thankful, gave 10%. And this is before Moses was ever even born. Yeah, 400 years before the law. Right. He actually, t- actually gave, didn't just give, he gave specifically 10% to the high priest. Right. And so... It's a wonderful example because he did that when there was no law. And so now with the New Testament, um, it, we're called to even greater. Mm-hmm. The Lord is like, when Jesus was speaking, he said, hey, like when you're angry at somebody, it's murder. When you lust with somebody at some a woman, it's adultery. It's actually an even higher standard. And in Luke 11, he was talking to the Pharisees, and this is in red print. Okay, he said to them in the red print, in the red print, you guys, the words of Jesus, That's right. he said to them, it's good that you tithe Pharisees. It's probably the, the only nice thing he said to them in the yeah. entire New Testament. He's like, it's good that you tithe, but you're forgetting to love God. You're forgetting about the things that are important because they had herbs and they were tithing like 10% yeah. of the income of their herbs. And Jesus was like, hey, like, it's good that you're tithing and you should, but you're forgetting to love God because the two commandments that fulfill all of them are love God and love your neighbor. Yeah. And you love God by tithing because it says that it's holy and it's set apart, just like we are holy and set apart. So yeah. what does that mean? 
we belong to God. Yeah. So if the tithe is holy, it was never ours. It belongs to him. Exactly. It's kadosh in Hebrew, holy. Your tithe is holy and, y- and you're holy. Same word, both are God's. In English, it's taboo. I know. It means you don't touch it. <laughs> no, but we got to talk really about funny. it. You got to talk about we it. We got to talk about it because it's a key that will open doors for people. You have any financial miracle stories? I'm your looking whole, at my husband. Your like, whole what? life is I'm a I'm like, what am I allowed to share? <laughs> oh, I got you. Um, yeah, sure. So we moved to Reading in 2020, and it was two weeks before we were told 14 days to slow the spread. And so basically the whole, yeah, basically the whole world shut down. We're like, okay, I guess we're here for the pandemic. Awesome. And, um, the Lord started speaking to us to purchase land. And, um, I remember being pretty afraid, like it could completely go sideways. When you purchase land, you buy cash. There are, there is no lending to buy land. And, um, I just stood on the Isaac scripture because he sowed in a drought, yeah. Isaac, and he reaped a hundredfold in a drought. Yeah. I mean, just to reap a hundredfold in normal circumstances is a lot. But and when there's no rain. But when there's no rain, it's kind of a miracle. Crops. Yeah. It's like a c- car with no gas. Right. Mm-hmm. And he still won the race, but he didn't have any gasoline. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I love it. The car examples. Yeah. So uh, we ended up buying up some lots and... We put a team together and we started developing and building homes. And when we sold them, it was the top of the market. Wow. And we never would have known that. But Jesus knows the end from the beginning. And that's what I mean by inviting him into your finances is he's your business partner in life. He's like the CEO, COO of your money and of your life. And so it's having dialogue with him before you make decisions instead of doing them in your own will or your own flesh because he will protect you. He will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. That's so good. Is it okay to have a plan for how much money you make or how much money you save or a business plan? Yes. Tell me about that. Um. I think having a financial plan in place is wise. Okay. I think uh, if you look at the story of Joseph, when he saw that there was going to be a famine, he told Pharaoh, which I think was wisdom from heaven, mm-hmm. to s- put away one-fifth, which is 20%, mm-hmm. and then there'd be enough when the famine came. Yeah. And so uh, in my book, I have a chapter on budgeting, and I recommend 10% for investing and 10% for giving, and the other 80% is laid out. And it comes from that. It's really good to set 20% aside. And if you can do more, that's wonderful. Yeah, but start there. Yeah. Start somewhere. Because um, investing and giving is like a muscle. Yeah. You know, it's a pattern that you do through your life. And I have a chapter on how to teach your children as well. Because we weren't really born to, like, share. I mean, one of the first things I teach my kids is how to share. Like yeah. they don't come out of the womb knowing how to give and to share. It's it's something that is taught and it's something that you get a heart connection with and then you partner with the Lord in that. And investing is the same thing. It's being a good steward with your money so that it can multiply, so that you have something that the Lord can go 100% multiplication. Do you What do you think about credit cards and debt and that sort of thing? So personal debt, yeah. I think it's good to not have it. Okay. I understand things come up. And if people don't have an emergency fund, yeah. you know, you need air conditioning. Yeah. Like get your air conditioning fixed and put it on your credit card, right? Yeah. Like, I don't think it's good to be legalistic about it, but I okay. do think it's good to have parameters in place so that you set yourself up for success. Yeah. So it's short-term debt, um, I always encourage people to put a plan together to pay it off in like 12 to 18 months, whether it's credit card or personal loans and things like that. As for long-term debt, which is like mortgages and student loans. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I tell people is that for long-term debt, if you go into debt for something that increases in value, it's much better than going into debt for something that decreases in value. Like putting a Louis Vuitton purse on your credit card that yeah. you don't have money to pay off is not a good idea. But if you buy an investment property that you can rent out and somebody else ends up paying off your yeah. mortgage every month, better idea. So debt can be used in different ways. Okay. The area people get into trouble is when greed comes into play because in the bible it actually doesn't say that debt is a sin it talks about how the 
uh, is Israelites, and also the Lord says to the believers, I want you to be able to lend and not borrow. Have so much yeah. wealth that you're the one lending and not borrowing. Yeah. You just can't charge your fellow Israelites interest. Yeah, so that's a really good example because if the Lord said you're going to be the lender and not the borrower, then the process of borrowing can't be evil, right? Right. Because you're participating in it, Correct. right? Correct. You're, you're, in other words, if it was like selling drugs, you can get drugs, but you but you can't take them. Mm-hmm. It, it, that would be evil. Right. But the Lord's like, you can be the lender, but you can't, but I don't want you to be the borrower. Right. Well, what I'm getting at is like if is if lending was like selling illegal drugs, he wouldn't be like, sure, you should do this. You should do this, right? Yeah, it's part of the like economic it was system, right? Yeah. So that would be amazing if all believers we were the lenders. How cool would that be? Yeah. Let's all get to that place. Totally. And you know, I understand that that is obviously not the everyone's position. And yeah. so, regarding mortgages, I encourage people by the time they're 65 not to have one. So if you're listening to this and you're around 40 only have 15 years left on your mortgage. And the reason for that is because when you get to that age bracket of 65, 70, Mm -hmm. you really want to be able to have no debt, no mortgage, no credit card, nothing, right? So you can look behind you and start helping the generation. Exactly. And leave a legacy, which is very difficult to do if you don't put yourself in a position to have that type of financial freedom. Yeah, it's really, um, you know, one of the things the Lord has done in us is obviously we grew up in, I grew up in poverty, Kathy grew up in a middle class family, but we never thought about the next generation. I mean, obviously we didn't, we didn't have any money to think about this generation, much less the next generation. So we lived hand to mouth and and Kathy's folks didn't either. But, you know, I had a vision about about believing a legacy and Proverbs says house and wealth are an inheritance from fathers. A righteous man leaves an inheritance to his yes. children's children. So, you know, we just began to put $50 a month in the bank. We, we opened trust accounts for our grandkids. I love that. And it was, you know, it was when we didn't have $50, you know, each. So I think at the time, I think we had like six grandkids. So, so like, like was bucks. not out of abundance. It was like. No, it was out of lack. Wow. But as, as, that, as that's grown and as our own personal wealth has grown, mm-hmm. as we've paid off our own houses and cars and everything, and we basically don't owe anybody anything and we started like okay i'd love to leave an x amount of dollars to each of our grandchildren you are a glowing example chris but I when I, let me just say this but but a, a heart change in the last couple of years has been why don't we give it while we're alive yeah do why that don't too. we help our kids get their their first house why don't we help our kids get their yes. first our grandkids get their first car yes why don't we why don't we invest where while we're alive so that we don't have a dead will, but we have a living trust. I love that. And I think that's exactly what you're saying. And it's been a yes. lot more fun, too. Way more fun. You can, yeah. like, enjoy it with them. It's been so much fun. Mm-hmm. Is there, we got a couple more minutes. Any parting thoughts that you'd like to share? Um, I really just wanted to bless people today and bless their finances. Yeah. And just encourage them that, like, they don't have to stay in poverty if they are. Yeah. And that. Psalms 139.16 says that all the days of our life are written in a book before one of them came to pass. And so that's amazing. There's like actually books written about us in heaven and coming before the father and asking him that our life would line up with that, that there'd be no discrepancies with what he had in his heart for us when we were in our mother's womb, because there's a destiny over our finances. Yeah. And each person, it's going to look different. Maybe for one, they're going to be in education. Another, it's politics. And if that's you, I bless you. Another, it could be entertainment. Whatever it looks like, there is a definite like plan for their life. And I think when we get to heaven, we're going to see, it's going to be like a quick audit. Like how much of this did you actually walk out and, th- and did you trust me with? Totally. Did you fulfill your divine destiny? Yeah. Like was it 20%, 30 or is it like 100 and I want it to be every, like, I that is dotted and T that is crossed that yeah. God has in his heart for me. So good. I want to fulfill that. And Sorry. in most cases, it takes finances for that to happen, for you to have that type of influence on culture instead of culture influencing you. So beautiful. This book, Money Handbook here. Samia, Thanks, how'd Chris. I do? You did great. I won't try the last name, but you could do it. Petalino. Petalino. 
And uh, where can I get this book? It's Is this on Amazon? It's on Amazon. Okay. It's on uh, the Bethel website as well. Yeah, And great. it's in the bookstore locally. Thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, just want to let you know that we, we really love you. We'd love to connect with you. Um, you, can, you can get to us on kvministries.com. And love to have you buy this book and, and read it and actually have it change your life. And thanks so much for watching. Again, Samia, thanks so much for coming and love your book. Thanks for having me.